Welcome to the recording of the Partners 2020 Ask the Expert session for Computer Science. This session was hosted by careers consultant Karen Parkhouse and she was joined by our guests Newcastle University alumni and software engineer Scott Walton and principal software engineer Chris Preston. Each of our guests will be going through a short presentation to tell you a little bit more about their career to date so far before Karen leads them in a Q&A with questions that were submitted by some of our partner students that tuned in live and some that were submitted prior to the session. Without further ado, we're going to hand over to Scott to tell us a little bit more about his time at university and his career. OK, cool. So I just thought I'd do a little bit about me. So I'll start with the personal things. Like I, I was born in Newcastle. Um, in terms of like where I came from, like my dad was a factory worker. Um, and my, by the time I finished high school, my mother uh, owned a, a small sandwich shop in, in the city centre. And so, uh, yeah, so it sort of gives you an idea of my roots. I got, you know, I was in my family, I was the first, the first uh, to go to university. And yeah, and really the decision to study computer science only came when I was in college. That's when I sort of, I took the computing course that was offered there. Um, and that's where I started to like, actually really enjoy that side of things. Um, in terms of personal th things i do enjoy playing video games like bloodborne stellaris city sky if i want to really just chill out then it's just city skylines uh other things that i like spend a lot of time was running cycling swimming uh like triathlon that sort of thing also really love traveling but i first started learning program like i say around 17 um and, and like i i like to put this what i like to mention this because when i was 17 and I was starting to learn a program, I felt old doing it. And like, so you have this image in your head of like these whiz kid hackers that are like 11 years old and they're just like breaking into NSA mainframes and stuff. Like I can say with certainty that doesn't happen. Um, most people learn in their late teens um, and like it through education or through, you know, through, through interest as they get older. Like it's very few, like pe very few actual professionals started programming like in any sort of capacity when they were like eight years old. So, so you know, if, if, if this is still quite new to you, that's to like, I just want you to know that that's totally fine. It, it was new to me back then. Um, the important thing really is like that you love to, that you love to learn. And some photos of running and cycling, I actually took part in the Great North Run in 2000, like last year. Uh, yeah, and then in terms of traveling, this was actually uh, in 2018, um, I took my bike backpack by myself and just cycled across uh, the north coast of Europe so across the top of France at, in Belgium and the Netherlands and this was Bruges um, and it's an incredible city if you ever get a chance really visit it it's incredible um, yeah and then just to quickly education wise you know finished high school 2005 um, so at time out college that's sort of North Shields just sort of close to the coast it's underwent a few names since then so I don't actually know what it's called now um, but yeah, and then sort of went to Newcastle Union 2008, so it took that year out, uh, and studied computer science. When, when I was uh, there, you know, uh, to be honest, the, the best thing was the friends that I've made. Like, of all of my current friends, the majority were the ones that I made at university. Um, you, it's it's going to be probably the first time, it's the first time in my life, and it'll probably be the first time in most people's lives that like, you'll be with a large group of people by choice like you all have something in common you can join societies um uh, i know a few people join like you know there's different sports clubs things like that um and the most important thing you learn is how to study how to how to learn like learn how to learn you, you're a lot there's a lot more independence there's a lot more um you're expected to be more self-sufficient you're given direction you know you're given the topics you know but especially like especially in third year when you're doing that dissertation like you get to choose the topic this you know this level of freedom is fantastic you don't get this like at any point up to this point in your life um and so that alone just gives you such freedom to to direct your own learning uh and like you really benefit and it's something you learn that you will enjoy because you chose it. And when it gets tough, and you know there are plenty of times when it gets tough during a dissertation, things aren't coming together well. The fact that you know you want to learn this can take you through it, um, which I would say is fantastic. So I, uh, I in two thousand and nine. So while I was still at university, I went on the university jobs board. Was sick of working in shops, um, 
and the the university had like so, some openings for like not the university itself but they basically companies can put job postings on this jobs board um and basically it's part funded the university funds part of the placement and the company makes up the rest um and then what what you do is you work at that company for usually about 10 weeks um part time um and, and that like it's an opportunity to learn. It's an opportunity to sort of feel what works like, and you still get paid. You, you know, you are expected to, to do some something for that for that company. You're not. It's not just like you turn up and like sit at a computer and study. You, you know, they say, look, we want this from you, and that's really good because it means that what you get, like you, know, you get real experience. You know, you get to really practice the things that you're you're studying, um, and you know, they they liked they liked me enough that they decided to keep keep me on. So uh, when I graduated, I had a conversation. I said, do you want to stay? I said, yes. Um, and yeah, and from there, that's when we started working on this finance app for schools. Um, so, so the company, has actually, the company Pebble has been in business since 1992. Um, and we want to take this finance app and turn it into a, like a, an online app. Um, so you do all your finances online there's a ton of benefits i won't go into the detail but basically i was like i was like part of making that happen um and like at some point i think it was around 2013 maybe 2014 i've sort of like transitioned to be a team lead helping to grow the team like so i'd have some engine some developers engineers working underneath me um and, and like the amount you learn doing that is is just like it's another level you like uh everything you think you sort of learn in university, all that theory, then you have to crash it into the reality of working with other people and help them to bring other people along with you. It's, it's, it's a different experience. It's a scare. It's a scary experience, but you do, you do, um, you grow, I uh, grew from it a huge amount um, and, you know, made a lot of mistakes um, and some costly ones, um, you know, uh, as like, I actually say to people now, if you haven't brought the system down at least once in it, it, the current place, people say, oh, I brought, you know, I'm bringing the, uh, I brought this down. I've caused a lot of trouble for everybody. And I would say, look, don't worry about it. If you haven't brought it down at least once while you've worked here, you haven't tried hard enough. Um, and, and yeah, I mentioned the company what had been around for, for 25 years. This was the 25th anniversary party. Um, um, but yeah, in two, so 2017, I was like, right, it's time to move on. Um, you know, so I've been, you know, I've been there for like nearly a decade, um, been at Pebble for nearly a decade. And I was like, right, I, I want to try, I want to try some different opportunity to grow some, some new skills. So, um, like I accepted the contract in 2017. Uh, um, but you know, hot job, fantastic. I managed to go out to Malta in November. 2017 before before officially starting and, and actually met everybody at one of the the meetups there but I, when i joined hot i joined sort of went down from team lead back to sort of and like what's engineer level um but I, I was more than happy to do that obviously the opportunity to learn is is uh was massive um for so people who don't know what hot does if anybody's ever been on a website and saw a little you might have seen a little widget that asks for feedback or a little questionnaire that comes up on the bottom right uh, and you'll see hot jar at the bottom. Um, so that's one of the things we do. Essentially, we are like, it, it's like sort of uh, analytics and sort of uh, feedback tools for, for websites. Um, and yeah, so like what, what that actually means is there's quite a lot of, um, there's quite a lot of uh, data processing required um, of which I do none of because I work in the billing team, but it's still incredibly, incredibly fascinating uh, area of business. Um, you know, really great team, great people. You learn so much. Um, and then in sort of 2019, I sort of came back to a team lead. I actually ended up, how that came about was my team lead at the time moved to Singapore. And um, so I had to leave. Uh, and I just said, hey, can you put a good in, word in with the founders and ask if I can have your job? He did. And so that's how I ended up there. Um, you learn a huge amount. Like I say, um, working remote is, is incredible. We have twice a year meetups. And, and this was actually in Malta in, 20, in 2018, um, in the summer. Um, and this was actually one of the villas we, we, were, we were working from in St. Julian's. So this was quite a nice place to, um, to look out onto, this, onto the sort of the Mediterranean. Uh, and yeah, 
And a couple of other things. So I've I've been to some Python conferences, sort of programming conferences, uh, so like front end developers meetup group. Uh, and yeah, I also ran the local meetup group, Python Northeast, which is really, really good. So uh, you can also free to answer questions about that as well. And that is it. Okay, that, that's great. Scott, thanks. Thanks very much um, no. for that. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll come to the questions at the end. Um, so if I can pass over to Chris for um, his presentation, we'll have another 10 minutes and then we'll, we'll um, have an opportunity to, for people to ask questions. So I'm uh, Chris Preston, as it says there, I'm a principal software engineer. And I'm just going to, like Scott did, tell the story of how how that came to be true, I guess. Uh, there are some similarities with Scott's story and some differences, so I'll try to uh, talk about those. So before university, at school, I was mostly focused on science and maths. They were my main interests. Um, and so um, that was sort of what I thought I would do, something science or mathsy, but didn't really know. Um, I did attempt, this is similar to what Scott was talking about, I did attempt to become a self-taught programmer because it was something I was interested in, but there was no internet then. Um, we just had magazines with listings in and a lot of guesswork and I wasn't very good basically, so I failed to become a self-taught programmer. So at the end of school I applied to, when I was thinking about university, I applied to engineering courses because engineering is like science and maths and there's always jobs so I didn't really know but I just thought engineering is probably a safe bet. Unfortunately I had another failure I failed to get the required maths A level grade that I needed so I decided to take a year out and get some work experience actually try to be an engineer for a year get some experience and see what happens and while while I was doing that I'd reset my maths A level and managed to get a B and I thought, great, I've got the B um, that I needed for the courses. However, there was another slight problem, which was I hated the work experience. So having had a couple of failures at things and not really knowing what I wanted to do and then hating the thing that I decided to do, I thought, well, what do I do at university then? Um, like Scott said in his family, I was the first person to go to university in my family. So I didn't really know much about anything. So I just thought, well, if I failed to become a self-taught programmer, perhaps I could be a properly taught programmer. So I ended up applying to do computer science at Durham University. I had the grades that I needed for that, managed to get into that um, and graduated with a 2-1 at the end of that, which was okay, not spectacular, but I was quite, quite pleased considering I had already failed to become a programmer. I thought that was quite a success. So, um, so that was the sort of the path that I was on then, but I already knew I didn't want to work in London or for a bank or what I considered to be anything boring. So what did I want to do? Um, I wrote to some video games companies. I found out, I managed to find the address of some companies, which wasn't that easy in the days before the internet. Um, and basically wrote off a load of letters, got no replies at all. So that was another failure. So okay, not, not going too well. So I ended up taking a job at Newcastle University in what used to be their marine engineering department. I don't know if it exists in the same form or if, if it's got a different name now, but um, my first job was working at a shipyard in South Shields, helping them put in IT systems, which they'd never heard about before because they were an old fashioned shipyard. Um, but while I was doing that, I was still applying uh, writing letters to video games companies trying to convince somebody that they should hire me and give me a chance because I loved things so much you know I was quite passionate about it and after working at that job for about nine months I managed to get a, an interview at Codemasters which is down in Warwickshire um, and they offered me the job and I, and I left and went to work at Codemasters so I went to make video games for a while so it took a few years to get there and quite a few failures and um, false starts along the way. But eventually, after years of trying, um, I did manage to get what I thought was my dream job, which was making video games. So that was quite exciting. So I'm quite 
old and when I'm talking about getting a job in video games, I'm talking about 1996. So some of the games that I've worked on are quite old. So these are the sort of the major titles that I worked on in the video games industry. I, I didn't do very much on the division, but I just put that on because I thought maybe somebody might have heard of that and won't have heard of any of these older ones. But basically I spent quite a, a, more than 10 years working on mostly driving games on all of the PlayStation consoles. Uh, PS5 will be the first one I haven't worked on. So I did that for quite a long time. Uh, absolutely loved it. It was fantastic uh, until burnout struck. And I don't mean the game burnout. I mean the emotional mental health issue burnout. So uh, as I got older, I started to have a family and um, balancing the life of a video game developer with the life of a family man was very challenging and I basically couldn't do it. It was too difficult and I had to accept that I was burnt out and start again, basically. So having done that for pretty much 10 years, I had to have a rethink for the good of myself, my own mental health and my family. And I thought, okay, well, what else is there I can do? Um, there must be something else I can be passionate about, like I was passionate about video games. Um, science was the answer. Like I said at the start, I always enjoyed science at school. Uh, I wasn't always very good at it. And as I've got older, I've found that I've um, got a bit better at some of the science stuff because I've maintained that interest. So it's like it was slower for me to learn, but eventually I've got there. So I thought, okay, maybe I can do something science related. I still loved it, still interested. Programming is programming. So as a software developer, you have a lot of transferable skills. The, the fact that I'd worked in video, video games for a long time didn't mean I couldn't do other types of programming. I think it's one of the strengths of doing a subject like computer science or some other software engineering or development related subject is that those skills are in demand in a lot of different industries and there's a lot of opportunity. And so, although I was burnt out in one industry, it didn't mean that I couldn't transfer to another. And so that's what I did. Newcastle has a lot of science going on. So uh, there was a lot of opportunity specifically in Newcastle, which is that's, that's where I had made my home. So um, it made sense to kind of to go for science for that as well, a place where my family are, where there was opportunity in the area I was interested in. So I managed to get a job at a place called Nonlinear Dynamics Limited, which was been around for a long time. It was founded in 1989, but in 2013, it was bought by a very large US corporation. And to kind of roughly summarize what we do, uh, as it says there, the company's focus is improving human health and well-being through analytical technologies and industry leading scientific expertise. And what that basically means is that we make scientific instruments and software. So the picture on the slide there is that's all stuff that's made by Waters, the company that I work for. So I only work on the software part, but um, those various boxes there are made either in Manchester or in the US um, and uh, we basically supply whole solutions to people for doing scientific analysis of various kinds. The sorts of applications that our software is used for are, well that, that's one of the products that I've worked on there, a quick screenshot. Um, that's, that's somebody basically um, trying to identify what molecules they have in, in some mixture of chemicals. So the sorts of applications that we're involved with is the biggest one is, is medicines and pharmaceuticals. So we have customers who are working on COVID-19 testing and vaccine development. Uh, I, I haven't worked on any of that myself specifically, but I, I know that we have customers who buy our software who are using it for that. So that's quite exciting. It's one of the reasons that I wanted to um, get into this line of work is I like to believe in the thing that I'm working on. Uh, so in video games, I loved video games and I saw the beneficial effect that they had on people, like the, the joy that they give. Um, 
and I, I was excited by that. And in, in my current job, I'm excited by the, the way that we can help uh, the species, I guess, solve problems. So the COVID-19 thing is big for us at the moment. There's a lot of work going on. We've been very busy. Uh, food safety is another one. Some people might remember a few years ago, there was a scandal where certain beef, supposed beef burgers turned out to contain horse meat. Our software and technology can be used for detecting that. You can literally smush up a burger and put it through our equipment. And at the end, the software will be able to tell you whether it's horse or cow or some other animal. It's, it's a little bit more complicated than I made it sound, but basically that's what it does. The software on the right there in that screenshot has been specifically used in the case of detecting counterfeit honey, which you might be surprised to think that there is a market for counterfeit honey, but Manuka honey is, uh, it's a special honey that's only produced in very small quantities in New Zealand, I think. And if you look at all of the products in the world that claim to contain Manuka honey, it adds up to far more than the world's supply of Manuka honey. So most of it is not telling the truth and you can use our, our software has been used in fact to analyze that and detect counterfeits. And another thing that would have been big this year is uh, waters were the supplier for the anti-doping tests at the Tokyo Olympics. So I assume that that will still happen next year if the Olympics go ahead, but uh, that's another big application for us is we can test samples from athletes and tell you what compounds are in those samples, for example. So. So I think it's all very cool stuff. I really enjoy working on it and it, it makes my science brain work hard all the time, which is great for me. So um, this is my last slide. I just want to finish on a few lessons that I've learned. Um, Scott talked earlier about the benefits of going to university and I agree with all of that. But I also wanted to say that I haven't used everything that I learned at university. The main things that I learned that were useful were teamwork, and some of the fundamentals about how software and computers work um, and also fundamentals like friendships like Scott talked about like my wife I met at university you know these these things last a lifetime it doesn't mean that every single course that you will do is going to be valuable uh, that's the experience that I've had anyway but some of it certainly was very valuable I've learned that it's important to embrace challenges so um, things get in your way you want to try to find a way past them. Scott talked about dreadful errors that take down the system and possibly affect people's lives. Obviously in my current job, if we're making medicines, or sorry, if we are helping people manufacture medicines, then um, that's a big deal. So things happen, you have to learn how to avoid them next time or do better next time and improve yourself and improve your tools and techniques. But that's, doesn't mean that you should shy away from difficult tasks because the difficult things are the most interesting and they teach you the most and they're also sometimes the most profitable like if it's hard it might mean you're the only person who can do it and the final aspect is there are a few times where doing the hard thing or volunteering for the hard job has got me noticed and managed to get me a promotion so um, it's worth embracing challenges and, a, and a, a reasonable company or a reasonable boss will know that these things are hard and will, uh, you know, recognize the effort that you put in, even if it ends in failure. There's no, you know, a failure is just what you look at what lessons you can learn. It's not the end of the line. Seek feedback is another important one. I've basically always been lucky that I've worked with people who are smarter than I am. I talked about my history at school. I was never a super gifted person in any particular area, but I have worked with people who are, and I just love learning from those people all the time. And if I was applying for another job, I would really look for a place where the people who interviewed me were much more knowledgeable than me. And I felt like I was having to work hard to do well in the interview. That's the kind of job that I would want because it's going to help me improve. And I think continuous improvement is a critical thing. Uh, these days, most companies use agile. Most companies use agile software development techniques. But I'm old enough to know that that's not a given. Not all companies are in good habits. And um, if you personally can get in good habits and think about your own improvement, how do you develop your own skills and your own professionalism, your own craft as a software developer? Uh, I think that's really, really important. And they're the kind of people who who have good careers, I think. And like I say, just care care about your craft. You know, want if you want to be good and you seek feedback and 
kind of assess your performance and try to improve and take on hard things that are just slightly harder than you can manage um, and I think they're all aspects of caring about your craft and getting better at your job and ultimately they're the things that I think are probably if I'm good at anything they're probably the things that I'm good at is is you know it, I'm good at getting better I guess which means one day I might actually be good at the other things as well so um, that's that's my main lessons learned I think uh, and that's my last slide that's the end thank you to scott and chris for those wonderful presentations we hope you found them useful and insightful we're now moving into the q a portion of this session where our guests are going to be taking some of the questions that were submitted live during the event karen will also highlight some of the questions that were submitted prior by you the partner students it was interesting listening to the sort of experiences that you both had at university um, and you were talking about the kind of the benefits that um, came from university, not just being in the specific learning, but the friendships and the relationships that you formed. Just on that point, I just wondered whether you could say a little bit more about um, how important the experiences were that you had alongside your studies in, um, in getting a graduate job. Whether, I think who wants to take that, that first? Scott, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can go first, uh, probably because like, I, I can point mine directly to university. So Newcastle Uni, um, I think you still do this. Uh, it's, um, it's called Newcastle Work Experience. Um, so it's basically a jobs board that it sort of gets highlighted at the beginning of the year and they're never mentioned again, which is a shame because it is really, really good. <laughs> um, and like what, what, what it basically is, is it's a jobs board. You go on. Uh, it, uh, employers post job like uh, roles that they have available for part-time work and this is uh, so it's a hunt it's a 100 so I'll I'll describe my experience uh, and if it's changed a little Karen can probably correct what that is but it was a, it was a 100 hour placement there was a um, it was 600 pounds at the time it's probably more now because minimum wages went up but and um, it's basically part for the university pays part the employer pays part um the great one of the great things about it is that almost nobody applies for these jobs so like it's basically you apply uh and if you know if, if you, you you can go and you can show that you know you know enough about what, what you're talking about and you you show a good willingness to learn you, you've got a decent chance of get getting the job i mean like because the employer is only paying like it's like no more than a third of your actual wage so it's quite low risk for the employer to just take a punt and give you a go have a go um i actually used it on the other side as well as an employer once i was team leading at pebble um, and like a couple of like some of the best people i worked with actually came through that scheme um so so it is it's a really really worthwhile scheme and and that's basically how i then and i took that and that's how i had my first job as well um so that's probably the most direct thing I did. Um, some of the other things, uh, like, like I say, I, th I think there are things like sort of the clubs uh, can be helpful, um, but th I think they're more like on the social side, you can, there is some benefit in the sense of like, you may meet people who, who potentially are going to be in future positions, but I can't speak to that personally because I, I wasn't sort of big on the clubs. I, I was quite a bit more antisocial. <laughs> in, in that age than, than I am say today where I actually do join clubs so Chris can I ask a quick question there just on that point uh, sorry uh, um, Scott mm -hmm. the, what do you think it was about your application that got you noticed uh, my application um, I have no idea I actually asked uh, I said I said like what was it and he, he said that like he, he didn't give any sort of detail on the application uh, so Michael who was the who, who was the uh, in charge at the time of the that that hiring at the time uh, uh, said that basically there was nobody else, <laughs> there was almost nobody else uh, applied, um, but he, he seemed to they just seemed to like like me sort of um, as, as during the interview like had a chat with with Michael Janis who was the CEO uh, uh, and like this seemed the same sort of okay um, with, with me they seemed to like me um, and like like I say I said like sort of when I started, there weren't too like Michael said he wasn't too impressed when I started, but with it, like you know, after sort of the halfway point, I started to change his mind, in, like in terms of like the work I was doing. I was working with like it was this was back in the early if if you have Android phones, like we're, we're talking 2009, yeah, so actually sort of the, 
like we were trying to mess around with some stuff with that um and he found out like i, I was start at the start wasn't too impressive but he, like the fact that i was able to pick it up and start really figuring out like what it was what we what we like what we wanted to do with it that that's when we st- like he started to f- see that actually you know that there's some good there's potentially some some good stuff there so so I, th- I think it was like sort of more the post interview part of the try like your willingness to pick things up and and give things a go um was something very, about the, the mindset yeah. what, based on your experience and i guess there's a question for both of you what what do you um what do you um your organizations look for when they're recruiting in addition to a degree could you could you summarize maybe just the two two key points for for that sure, I'll, I'll give a quick answer to that one yeah um, so we uh we take no, no, in normal years we take summer interns from newcastle university as well so um i've got quite a bit of experience of looking at cvs of people who are at university or you know a part way through their course and the things that stand out to us normally are um, it is about that sort of mindset of the, the 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 wanting to learn because everyone at that age is pretty much a blank slate in terms of knowledge or experience. So what you look for is that uh, um, kind of like, the desire to improve, the interest, and in the, the kind of the questions that they might ask. Like sometimes you get you get good questions and bad questions, you know, and they can give you some insight into okay, somebody doesn't know that, but when they ask a question in an interview, you can tell they're trying to really understand it versus a question that's kind of more, they're just asking because they know that they're expected to ask a question. So the, the quality of someone's question at an interview, I think is often a, a, a strong indicator. But at first on paper, before you get as far as interview, it can be very, very difficult to choose between people who have very little in the way of experience. And you can't tell if somebody's life is one that would allow them to do something outside of their studies. You know, they may not have time. They may have people who depend on them or something. So, you, so it's very, very difficult to say, oh, well, this person has loads of clubs that they're a member of and this one doesn't. Therefore, we'll pick the clubs person because you don't know what their circumstances are. But quite often, even a person who doesn't have a lot of opportunity to do that, if they are genuinely interested and motivated, they will have something that you think, oh, that it's interesting that they've done that because that indicates something about their interest. You know, they'll kind of reveal themselves a little bit with something that they've done that's not just part of their studies, or they might describe a project that they've worked on in a slightly different way to somebody else. Like they might focus on, um, I really learned about the teamwork aspect when I was working on this project. So something like that that's a bit more of an interesting comment, like the perspective on the little that they have done, is more interesting than just having listed, oh, I just did this, this, and this. Yeah, it's the depth, isn't it, rather than necessarily the volume? Yes, I think that's a good way of saying it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. like what Chris said at the end, I definitely, like when I, so um, Hotjar doesn't sort of hire people out, out of university directly, um, but when I was at Pebble, I, I was same sort of thing involved in that. Um, and like so the best hires I, I found in the people were people who, they, they had an interest and they could talk actually quite some depth it, about their even their own university work um and this was uh like for me for me that was a, a really good indicator and like being a bit older now I, I, like chris says you recognize that circumstance doesn't always allow people to to take on loads of extracurricular activity um but but you do like you can see that when someone has an interest versus they're just doing the course and they're not sure why yet and um and, and, and like I said, I do respect this is this is a hard thing. Like, it, this is something like when you're young, you don't always understand everything yet, um, and it's something that maybe comes a bit later. But but it does. It's the unfortunate reality of life is pe- if someone can has just jumped into a bit more depth a bit and figured that out a little earlier than you, that person does have an advantage. So it's worth worth sort of seeing that. And, and that that is actually to spend some time like. Under, try and understand your course understand like the why the, the why behind your course Ex, and expand a little bit like one of the nice things about university is I, th- I think lectures only make up somewhere between what 10 and 16 hours a week um if that like so, so you are like there is an expectation that you are going to do a lot of this self-study on your own um and that that's the purpose of university the purpose of university is not 40 hours in a classroom it's a small number of hours in the classroom and then a large number of hours 
spent independently studying it, the, the course. And so sometimes putting that extra effort in and just on studying around the subject, you yeah. know, helps, helps a lot as well. I think that that's, that's the point, um, Scott, that uh, her Chris made as well, that both of you are talking about the fact that it's not necessarily just the content, but it's actually, that's a very developing the kind of independence and um, the curiosity that you need to, to keep learning and, and keep developing. Yep. We've, got a, we've got a question that's just come through actually where um, I think it's for Chris actually it was about balancing um, work life um, demands um, and how that was difficult with a family when you're in the gaming industry. Um, the question is how manageable is it now in the software development aspect compared to when you were at the gaming company? I have no work-life balance issues anymore. I have a very happy life, both at home and at work, and it's all fine. I mean, I'm working from home at the moment, and I have no problem switching off. Like, my, my current company doesn't expect me to... In fact, we we actively ban overtime and things like that. You know, it's we, we understand that it has a negative impact, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's I'm, I'm totally fine and happy now. Thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it's, it depends very much on the kind of organisation you're in and the culture. Yeah, and I, and I don't want to necessarily give the impression that gaming is all terrible either. It's just, you know, the, exp the, the experiences I had, uh, they're questions that are worth asking of any employer, I think, no matter what industry they're in. Yeah, def like, I've definitely seen, like, it, working on a sort of a finance system for schools, sometimes does like small companies do can can sometimes happen anyway which is like you know a bit of you know some extra time and I, i've definitely like I, I've, I've had times where i was pulling 50 60 hour weeks and same sort of, like not not probably not to the level that like chris is describing but like I, I remember spending a year getting a migraine every three or four weeks and i it took about two months to clear once once i sort of took my workload back down to a manageable levels um and yeah. so i talk like yeah it's, it's you, a huge thing yeah you should demand good practices from an employer yeah. like you know sure yeah and, and i think it brings out the differences doesn't it in the cultures of an organization regardless of the size and the sector that you're in um yeah. it could be something that applies across the across the board i've noticed that we had an earlier question too which was about how do you go about finding fully remote opportunities yes um i'm not sure whether that's something that either if you feel you commenting in the sort of minute that we've we've got left just over a minute i think <laughs> oh yeah um, so, so for me it was linkedin um i like so i'd i'd u would use hotjar at the previous company so when i saw the name pop up on linkedin um, i actually missed out the, one of the reasons that hotjar was appealing and it's actually a really good question of uh like the alternative to sort of when you start think because salary obviously comes into things uh, and hot and so working remote, taking sort of the hot jar type salary means that in Newcastle, you can like, you're p being paid what's effectively a London rate for being in the Northeast. Um, and the diff the price, the cost of living difference is insane. Um, like, cause it was either, it was basically, it was either that I moved to London or Bristol to sort of get like, start saying sort of what was a uh, movement. But uh, in terms of like where LinkedIn's like a really good place, um, remote companies are actively looking to hire. It's not like they're hiding away trying not to, <laughs> to get people in. That they're in the same competitive market that everybody else is in. And I think more people are going to go that in that direction because of the realistic of the I... realistic climate. And that, that just ties into an interesting point that this week, I think everybody participating in the summer school spent a lot of time developing or looking at developing a LinkedIn profile. And I know there's other mm -hmm. platforms like GitHub and GitLab and so on as people yep. move on and get more experience. Yep. Um, I guess it's a question for both of you and I don't know if you can answer this in sort of 30 seconds each, <laughs> but, but how important do you think it is to have an online presence, even at this stage as people are starting their, their, their university or their career journey? Do you want me to go first? Yeah, you yeah, go first. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not a huge fan of LinkedIn personally, but that is entirely because I'm not interested in changing jobs. If I was in the position that these younger people are in where they're trying to break into the market or move up to a better job or something like that, I would be absolutely all over it. Um, because like Scott said, that is the best way, I think, of mm -hmm. making contacts with people who are looking for people like you. Sure. Yeah, LinkedIn's, it's just, it's a help, like, it just how you don't have to spend, like, ages on your, like, once you've got a job, like, you don't have to keep it up to date, like, you can just update it once you start looking again, because realistically, apart from recruiters, people aren't hugely hunting you out, 
Um, but yeah, once you, um, you know, yeah, uh, it, it's really important. The GitHub, um, yes, I had, like I do have a GitHub profile um, and I did maintain it um, particular, like it, it might have helped and it's something I do look at if people provide it, like it, it is kind of a plus point in the sense of like, it lets you sort of get a feel for how they work in real life, but it can be tricky. Some some roles do encourage it. Uh, and it's something I encouraged when I was at Pebble and some roles, so, some companies don't encourage it so much. And it it's kind of dependent on you, like sort of where you're at, what industry you're looking at and yeah. stuff as well. I'm the so, same as Scott. Like if there's a GitHub, I will look at it, but if it's not there, I won't class it as a negative. Yeah. Interesting to know. Um, uh, there's lots more I think that we could be asking you, but unfortunately the clock's ticking. I've got a, I've got a final question that I want to put to each of you, if I may. Um, um, so I'll give you the question and then we'll perhaps decide who, who goes first. But um, the question is, considering your time at your university, at university and your own career, what one bit of advice would you like to share with the partner students? Oh, well, my, mine's quite easy because mine is basically just don't don't give up or be put off if you have a setback. You know, everyone has setbacks and it's how you recover from that or how you move on to the next thing. I think that's that's what to focus on. Like I've failed loads of times and I've still done all right. Okay, thank you. And Scott? Um, yeah, like I'd probably say like be like, yeah, don't don't stress too much about like do, you know, do 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 what you need to do to, do to do well, make sure you enjoy what you're doing. Um, but also like one of the things like it, it can sometimes get feel quite intense when you're like, you, you've got like a, a hard deadline running and stuff like that. Like realistically, like, you know, it, it isn't the end of the world. Um, you can, you know, you, you can sort of like get things done and don't like kill yourself to get it done. Um, make sure you enjoy some of the social side. Uh, make sure you make friends. Okay, I think that's two really good pieces of advice there. Um, so sort of get involved and, and basically, you know, don't be deterred if, if things don't go to plan. Um, because yeah. actually, for most of us, I think it's probably we would all say that that's. I said John that's, Lennon that's said, life. "Life's life's what happens when you're making other plans." Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay, um, thank you so much, um, both Chris and Scott, for giving up their time today and sharing those insights. It's been really interesting to hear about your journey, um, and we hope given those of you that have joined us um, plenty to think about when you're considering your own future. Thank you for tuning in to this recording of the Partners 2020 Ask the Expert session. We hope you found the discussion and the presentations from our guests useful and insightful. Remember to stay up to date with further advice from alumni and industry professionals. Subscribe to our Newcastle University Career Service YouTube channel and you can follow us on our social media channels at NCL Careers on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We hope to see you in September. Good luck and take care.